Hello everyone, welcome to session 6 of LTech 676, Social and Ethical Issues in Educational Technology. In this session, we're going to expand on the notion of an indirect impact. Then, we're going to delve into the concept of socio-technical systems. And finally, we'll close out by comparing the findings of the Sutton and Warshower articles. So let's get started. A couple of you have asked about the concept of an indirect impact regarding our last critical reflection assignment. Essentially, the question is, what do you mean by an indirect impact on a dimension of equity? What's an example? Well, I'd like you to consider for the moment the chalkboard, a piece of older technology that has had a tremendous impact on schools. We can think about direct impact of chalkboards. If we think about that, we might come up with the idea that teachers use chalkboards in all kinds of ways to support their work with students. They might draft outlines, model their thinking in front of the class, create diagrams, and draw pictures to help explain important concepts. Another benefit of the chalkboard was that it was refreshable in the sense that it could be modified and erase, erased in real time. The direct impact was to empower teachers with a big, flexible workspace that could be used in front of students. Now, let's think a little bit about the indirect impact. And by indirect, we really mean the side effects or byproducts of the placement of chalkboards in classrooms. So in terms of indirect impact, we can imagine that chalkboards position teachers at the front of the room. And because of this, teachers control the knowledge and the flow of information when they're using chalkboards. Thus, an indirect impact of chalkboards may have been to reinforce the sage on the stage view of teaching and learning. Ultimately, chalkboards position teachers as the authority and it positions students as passive listeners that just should sit by and take in the knowledge that the authority possesses. So this is an example of analyzing chalkboards for its direct and indirect impacts. Of course, part of thinking about the role of technology in equity is to think about a given technology's direct and indirect impact. Now, I want to share with you another example that I stumbled across this weekend while watching TV. Now, some of you may have heard that Tiger Woods won an important tournament over the weekend. And what's interesting is Tiger Woods also won tournaments many, many years ago. But what he shared with reporters is what's different about then and now. And one of his observations is no one claps anymore. And the reason behind that is because everyone these days is holding a cell phone. Again, this is an example of an indirect impact. Cell phones aren't designed to prevent people from clapping, but it's a side effect, a byproduct of the intended design of cell phones. So I thought that was kind of an interesting example. And you can see here in the picture, everybody is holding up a cell phone. Now, I want to connect this conversation to the idea of the social technical system. And we keep running into this word socio-technical. So, for example, in the Marx paper, he talks about the components of these large socio-technological systems and other bureaucratic and ideological components. And we also see it in the Warshower article. He talks about to a broader focus on the socio-technical factors that influence whether and how these people access technology. So the question that I'm sure many of you are asking is, what does this word mean? What are we talking about when we're talking about socio-technical systems or socio-technical factors? This term relates back to the World War II era literature on organizational change and development. Socio-technical systems refers to the interaction of the social and technical aspects of any organizational system. So you can think back to the era of the assembly line, for example. And we can see here we've got three workers building a car. That automated assembly line is very technical in nature. It's advancing the car at a certain speed 
and it's, it's lifted up off the ground so workers can work on it. And over time, what researchers began to realize is, is that assembly lines were optimized technically, but they weren't optimized socially. In other words, they weren't optimized for the way humans work. And they essentially ignored any human-related factors about what might optimize or make this an optimal work setting for human beings. And so the theory of social technical systems was really founded on two main principles. Now the first principle stated that the interaction of social and technical factors creates the conditions for successful or unsuccessful organizational performance. In other words, if you want to have a successfully performing organization, it's the interaction of the social and technical factors that's going to make that happen. And these interactions can consist of linear cause and effect relationships. And these are the relationships that are normally designed by people. But you can also have nonlinear, complex, and unpredictable relationships. And these are the good or bad relationships that are often unexpected, that emerge accidentally or indirectly when you put people and technology together. And the second main principle behind socio-technical systems theory is that the optimization of one aspect of the system tends to increase the quantity of unpredictable, undesigned relationships and also the relationships that are harmful to the system's performance. In other words, if you over-design focusing on the technical aspects of a system, you are going to cause problems with the social aspects, and of course vice versa. And so you really need to pay attention to both aspects of the system, the social and the technical, and importantly, how they interact. So that's a little bit about what people mean when they're talking about when they're talking about socio-technical systems or socio-technical factors. So we can apply this idea of a socio-technical system to the chalkboard. The direct impact of the chalkboard had a linear cause and effect impact on teaching. This relationship was designed. On the other hand, the chalkboard had a nonlinear complex impact on learning this idea that it may have subtly suggested to students that they passively sit by and just listen to the teacher. That was an unexpected relationship. It wasn't intended. Someone who applied a socio-technical systems analysis to the chalkboard would have realized that technically the chalkboard was very efficient, but socially it perhaps had some problems. Okay. Moving on, so I want to talk about the two articles that we've read recently, the Sutton article analyzing 1980s issues of equity and computers in the schools, and the Warshower article, which was really summarizing research from the 2000s, again, about equity and computers in the schools. Let's compare the two in terms of analysis of inputs. Now, remember that when we're talking about inputs, we're talking about what schools start with when educating students, and this includes financial, physical, and human resources. And typically what we look at when we're thinking about inputs is access, access to all of those resources. So in 1991, Sutton reported that there were major race, class, and gender differences in terms of access. Some of the evidence she found were the ratio of students per computer, and there were also major home differences in access for boys and girls. Families of male students were more likely to own a computer than families of female students, and boys were three times as likely as girls to attend a summer computer camp. So what did Warshower report? Well, he talked about reports suggesting that progress has been made in extending home internet access to low-income and minority households, However, gaps based on income and race still remain substantial. For example, he pointed out that only about 30% of Native Americans have broadband access, compared to almost 70% of Asian Americans, whereas 18% of low-income households have broadband access, compared to 90% 
of high-income households. He also talked about access to technology not being a binary division between information haves and information have-nots. Rather, there are differing degrees and types of access. And importantly, many low-income or immigrant youth have few friends or relatives who are sophisticated users of digital media. And as he points out, that has downstream impact on what st students are able to learn while using the computer. A second area of analysis focused on processes. And of course, processes have to do with what happens within schools when students are educated, how they are treated, what courses they are offered, and of course, measures around processes have to do with types of use, teachers' attitudes, and curricula. So let's recap what Sutton found. Sutton reported that there were race, class, and gender differences in types of use. She pointed out that only 7% of students in Title I schools were taking programming versus 14% of students in non-Title I schools. She also reported only 13% of high SES, predominantly white schools, reported intensive drill and practice versus the minority schools. And she also found that girls were underrepresented at elementary, middle, and high school level programming, game playing, and before and after school use. So, what did Warshower find? Well, drawing on a study by Mimi Ito, he pointed out that there are really two primary categories of online practices that today's youth pursue. The first category has been labeled friendship-driven practices, and these are practices that involve hanging out with peers online, and they either take place and or complement other forms of youth socializing, such as hanging out at the mall. The other form is interest-driven activities, and this involves communicating, game playing, and sharing of media. It is the specialized activity, interest, or niche identity that is driving motivation, rather than merely socializing with local peers. And this is important because these are contexts where kids find relationships that center on their interests, hobbies, and career aspirations. And Warshower also points out that teachers in low SES schools used a disproportionate amount of time to teach hardware and software operations, and they were reluctant to assign homework that required out-of-school access to the internet. So again, we're seeing some of the themes talked about in the 1991 Sutton article carried over to the Warshower article although we're getting some nuances in understanding differences in the types of use. The third area was analysis of outcomes, and outcomes, of course, have to do with what are the results achieved by schools, such as test scores and graduation rates. And here we really focus on things like student attitudes and computer-related competencies. In 1991, Sutton reported race, class, and gender differences in computer competence. She found differences in gender related to computer literacy. She reported students had more experience using computers, were more competent in their knowledge about them and in their use of computers. One study reported that pupils who had computers at home believed that more of their learning about computers was done at home than at school. And then another study found that boys outperformed girls in programming commands, programming composition skills, and debugging. Let's compare that to Warshower's findings. Interestingly, Warshower introduced us to this idea of the fire metaphor of information technology. Just as a fire radiates heat, many people expect a computer to radiate learning. And of course, that's a misguided assumption about the role of computers in schools. Warshower argues that the most persuasive evidence that access to computers raises academic outcomes such as grades, test scores, and graduation rates, comes from home rather than school settings. He also reports that, based on one study, that minorities and low SES students were less likely to have a computer, and even when they did, they, as well as females, received less academic benefit from having one compared to white, high SES, and male students. The explanation for this, of course, is what they call the social envelope. 
minorities and low SES students don't have the mentors and the resources at home to help guide them in the use of more sophisticated use of that home computer. Thus, they're getting less academic benefit from having a computer at home. And Warshar also reports that drill and practice activities favored in low SES schools tend to be ineffective, whereas the uses of technology disproportionately used in high SES schools achieve positive results. So there we have a kind of a side-by-side -side, 1980s versus the 2000s comparison on the impact of race, class, and gender differences in access, processes, and outcomes. Now, I want to connect all of this to Dana Boyd's book, It's Complicated. And in that book, Boyd argues, in order to address emerging inequities, we must consider the uneven aspects of the social platforms upon which we are building. And that's really where I want to leave today's article. I want us to think about what are the uneven aspects of social platforms that we are building. Okay, everyone, we're out of time for this week. Thank you, and I'll see you in Canvas.